Well, look, Dad, your friend is building it. My friends, we were downtown driving around the new soccer stadium that is being built right here in St. Louis, Missouri, when my son Patrick yelled that out from the back seat of the car. Look, Dad, your friends are building it. He was referring to my friends at Keeley Companies. Keeley Companies is proud to be a part of the team that is bringing Major League Soccer to America's first soccer capital right here in St. Louis, Missouri. As construction partners of the St. Louis City Stadium, they are looking forward for this project to be a place for entertainment, camaraderie, and passion for generations to come. You can learn more about that project and look what else they're building, Dad, by visiting them right now online at KeeleyCompanies.com. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Mental health challenges and broken relationships are a part of life. And yet, my friends, they don't necessarily have to negatively define us going forward. Our guest today, his name is Dr. John Deloney. He is a mental health expert. He's the best-selling author of Redefining Anxiety. It's a great book. And he's host of the Dr. John Deloney Show. That show, by the way, is a caller-driven show that gives you real talk on relationships and mental health challenges. Armed, this man is, not with one, but two PhDs. That's just bragging. He also has two decades of experience in counseling and crisis response John's goal is to help others navigate tough decisions, improve relationships, and remind us that we are worthy of being well. Earlier this week, John's most recent book titled Own Your Past, Change Your Future hit bookshelves around the country and around the world, caught the attention of those like Les Parrott, Patrick Lencioni, Dave Ramsey, among many, many others, saying it is the right book at the right time. Today, during our conversation, John's going to remind us that we all, yes, each and every one of us, I'm talking to you right now, my family and friends, we all carry the weight of some trauma. We all do. John's going to describe what some of that trauma looks like. Some of it's capital T, others, smaller case T. But regardless of what we've been through, we are carrying the weight of trauma based on the stories that we were told by others and the ones that we tell ourselves. And those stories are like carrying around a bag of bricks. John today is going to teach us how to let go of that bag. So join us as John unpacks for us not only that bag, but also for us how we can honestly embrace our past and take practical steps to ensure that the best is yet to come. So without further ado, grab your journals, open wide your minds and hearts, and get ready to welcome into your family one of my friends. His name is Dr. John Deloney. John Welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. What's up, Brother John? How we doing? Man, I'm a huge fan of yours, but for those who uh, somehow missed the introduction I just gave you, when, when you have an opportunity of introducing yourself to a new friend, how do you do it? Oh, man. I'm John, and I am the lucky husband of Sheila, and I'm the father of two remarkable little kids, and uh, I'm a nerd at heart, and that's usually where I stop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, an, I'm quite the nerd, man. Um, I've had a lot of adventures in my life and a lot of professional experiences, and I've been really, really lucky along the way to have some great mentors that have brought me to some fun corners of the, of the universe with them. So um, that's, that's usually where I start. So as a father, as a daddy of two, as a nerd, and uh, doing some cool things professionally, and then as they ask you a little bit more about, so do, what do you do professionally? How do you respond? <laughs> as my son... <laughs> So I, up until a few years ago, I was uh, a senior leader at universities, um, at, at colleges and universities. I was a dean of students or in a dean of students type role and a professor and a researcher. I was just a, a geek who hung out in colleges with college students and with academics and, and then with students and their families. And as my son, who's, he's about to turn 12, so he's 11, he reminded me the other day, dad, you're not cool. You're a YouTuber, dad. So that's what I do now. <laughs> I uh, took a dramatic left turn career-wise a couple of years ago and joined Dave Ramsey and his team here 
as the the mental health relationships guy um, walking along. Dave, Dave has said for years that with when working with people that money is 80% behavior and mental health and relationships and 20% math. And so he brought me on to help with the other 80%. Well, man, I, what I want to hear about is as you took that seat at a legendary signal, touching lives around the United States and around the world, how you got there, what, what you learned along the way and how we can apply that going forward. So l- let's Let's back the moving truck out of Nashville. You're going to turn the reverse beeping sounds on and, and head all the way back home. T- tell our listeners where you, where you grew up. So I was born and raised in Houston, and my dad was a homicide detective and a SWAT hostage negotiator. He was a gangster. I had the full mustache, the Texas cop, the whole thing. And, um, and then about halfway through my childhood, maybe middle school-ish, if my memory serves me well, he had always volunteered with youth programs and helping people um, and families in the middle of the night deal with, deal with trauma and, and tragedy, help kids getting out of jail, things like that. Um, he's pretty far ahead of his time on some of those things. And he really hit a, a, a control alt delete halfway through uh, my childhood and became a pastor at a large church working with youth. And then at the same time, my mother comes from a faith tradition that uh, she wasn't allowed to go to college. That was not women had one role and this was their job and their job was to um, be quiet and stay at home and do whatever everyone else needed them to do. And at 42, uh, she summoned the courage to grab a machete and head off into the woods. And she took a single one. She took one community college class (laughs) and she did good. And I think I was a freshman in high school, I think. And so we took um, algebra or geometry together or something. Of course, she crushed me in it. (laughs) <laughs> and then the next semester, she took one more class and one more class the next semester. And so she starts at 42 with one community college class. And at 57, she graduates with her PhD and she's a mythologist. And now she is in her 70s. She just retired as a department chair at some fancy university. She travels all. It used to be nine Xanax to get her on an airplane to go to a family thing. And now she's presenting at Oxford and Wales and all over the world. And so she's had this wild second life. Where that's all important for me is, unbeknownst to me as a child and as into my college and early professional career, I absorbed two major lessons. When the building's falling down, you go in. Mm. When there's people that need to be helped, you go in. And it may cost you everything. That's what your job is. And number two, there's no such thing as age. There is no such thing as it's too late. You start over when you start over. And when you do start over, you do really, really good work and you work hard. And you make hard sacrifices. And so then fast forward, I, I was a high school teacher for a few years and was, I've always, I've been public speaking my whole life since I was a little kid. And um, then I got my fancy pants degree and there is nothing, John, nothing worse than somebody who just graduates with their graduate degree. They're so annoying, man. <laughs> they put it on their email signature. They tell everybody, right. God, their handshake is different. They're just annoying. I was that guy times 10. And um, as the story goes, um, I'm in a long line of people who chased titles and money and external things to try to fill me up on the inside and uh, ended up hitting a wall. Mm. And uh, then I ended up, my wife and I transitioned out and we got, a, I got a job at another university that was smaller. Uh, I was working in colleges and universities at this time. And I really started a journey back about 10 or 15 years ago. Like what happened to me? And what's happening to my marriage? What happened to my friends' marriages? What's happening to our country? What's what is happening? And that led me down a path towards a, a second PhD in counseling. I'm I'm a curious nerd by nature, so um, what's what is happening? Like, wh- where do we get sideways here? And um, so the back half of my life has been dedicated to walking alongside people when the wheels have absolutely fallen off. And I've spent some time working with cops and. Um, uh, as a victim services guy behind closed doors in the middle of the night with the worst of the worst situations. And, um, and then one day I was speaking to a group of college students and their parents, There's about a thousand people in this theater. And I was giving them the old college pitch and Dave Ramsey's executive VP was in the audience. And she said, I'm going to hire that guy. Mm. And I had never had no social media. My whole life's mission was to not be on the internet. And now I'm a YouTuber, John. <laughs> Well, man, I'm glad you're cool now. What I'm going to do is actually slow you down just a little bit and walk through that story to meeting that leader from Ramsey. 
because I think there's a lot you learned along the way that we can apply in our lives. And so you, you mentioned first your father, yeah. this crisis negotiator, this SWAT team leader, man. I mean, th this is this is a man's man. Did he bring work home? Did he talk about the kind of stuff he was seeing while he was at work with you around the dinner table? Yeah. And so we have a we have a pretty caustic sense of humor in my family. And when your dad's a homicide detective, it just makes its way through. I've had to learn over the years. That's not a good conversation for the workplace, John. Or, right. hey, we're all trying to eat dinner here. Let's don't talk about the dead body you saw yesterday. Right. So it's not good. That's that's some of the conversations I grew up. The other side there was no discussion of secondary trauma. There was no discussion of right. how does a guy who deals in the in traffics in the hurt of other people, how does he come home and how does he, what tools and, um, and community surrounds him to help him live a whole life. And that those conversations didn't exist in the seventies and eighties and even into the early nineties. And so, yeah, I've got on one hand, a man who is one of the most extraordinary men and leaders in his community ever, who's also, man, his body has kept the score to quote Vanderfolk. It has absolutely been a price to pay. Mm. And so you, you get, I had a ringside seat to that. Well, I was, I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to ask you, what did he teach you to do and what did he teach you not to do? And it sounds like that was one of the lessons that you've got to handle with the, the secondary trauma a little bit different than maybe dad did. Yeah, you, you got to go in, and if you're not healthy and you're not well, you're of no good to anyone. Mm. And so before you go running into a building to help people, um, make sure you're equipped to go into that building. And that means you got to go see somebody. you got to talk to people. You've got to have a group of men and women in your life that you trust that you can be open with. Like there's all, you know, you got to take care of your physical body. you got to do these things so that you can go in and do that. John, you shared a story that surprised me in the book. And you, you talked about dad buying groceries, looking left and right, kind of peeking over his shoulder and ultimately uh, not uh, the credit card bounce, man. It did not go through and he needed help simply bringing food home for the kids. Just unpack that story for us. Finances was, was a significant stress in our home. And the older I've, when I was a kid, I just knew we didn't have any money. I knew we were broke. What I didn't understand was the existential weight um, two big things came into play in my community. One, my dad was a homicide detective in Houston. So he moved way out of town into the woods, right? Back then you could just get a phone book and go knock on somebody's door and find them. And so, um, he moved us way out right before the oil chemical boom hit Houston. So in our tiny little neighborhood, suddenly we're surrounded by gajillionaires and brilliant people. And so the temptation in the 80s and early 90s, when credit was this relatively new thing that was just being doled out like Pez dispensers, was to participate in, oh, if they're driving that car, I'm, I'll try to figure out how to do that too. So there was this constant pressure to keep up. And the mathematical reality is that we're living two different lives. We go right. to the same church, we go to the same schools, but we have two very different existences. And the second one that has come to hit me more recently, as I wrote the book, I actually had a moment of deep um, sadness and empathy for my dad. He's still alive. I still love him. We're still connected. He gave everything to his local community. And he gave everything in service of being a police officer. That was a big deal to him, to love and honor and serve the community with most people. I had no idea what was going on in the middle of the night, the things he saw, the things he did. And he made $19,000 a year. And it, it, there was a, a mix match uh, between the level of service I'm providing to my community. And this is what my community in turn thinks I'm worth. Right. And so the store, you know, not being able to, we didn't have extravagance. They had one car that they shared and we didn't have a lot, but to, to work as hard as he did on behalf of his community and not be able to buy milk and bread and bologna for his kids. I'm now understanding it wasn't just about being broke and being embarrassed that we didn't have a lot of money. There was a deep existential like, the thing about purpose here and value mm -hmm. and worth. Right. But the story is, he, yeah, man, it, he went and he knew he had three hungry kids at home and he went and swiped the, the ATM card, knowing there's no money in there crossing his fingers that it would just be a, an exorbitant late fee that he could pay and he could get food for the night. And it got declined as he was walking out the, store manager happened to be somebody that he had served in the middle of the night in a crisis call. And she came over and, and with her actions said, sir, your money's no good here. And mm -hmm. she gave him groceries and walked him out. 
And since then, um, his demand that his kids be generous, his demands that his kids be on the lookout at all times for people who are hurting and struggling, um, I think really can, can have a laser back to that moment when somebody said, hey, I see you and I see you're hurting and I'm going to step in. You mentioned you learned two big things growing up. The, the first was when the building's burning or, or crumbling, you go in, you go in. And the second thing is you learned it's never too late to change. Right. Talk about some of the lessons your mother taught you. My mother went through, she read all of the 60s and 70s feminist liberation literature in the mid 90s. And her husband was a cop. Right. <laughs> so she had this like this singular revolution yeah. in my living room, in our living room. And so it was incredible time to grow up. Um, I remember her getting in front of the TV while we're trying to watch a ball game and she's reading to us in old English Shakespeare and just guffawing. And we're like, I, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> and so there's this, there's this cool thing, the story, there's a cool story about, you know, a mom who says, I'm going to find my voice and a dad who's full, so far ahead of his time. And how do I support my wife? And she ended up working at Enron and it, the, some big players along the way to her professor job, just some extraordinary experiences. And there was a little bit, uh, not a little bit, there's a lot of the car was driving down the road and it got thrown into reverse on the highway. Mm. We all, you, she used to make dinner for everybody. And suddenly we were on our own and suddenly, or it was, Hey, I've put a bunch of meals in the freezer. Um, y'all can get them out and make them, or I'm going to try to balance this and this. I got to see what it's like being a, educated woman and a working woman and also a woman who's who's also has to keep up the domestic responsibilities right and the, the pain and turmoil amidst all how do you toggle college and then to, toggle one of the largest corporations in the world and toggle mom i want a snack i want a snack i want a snack and everything in between and not just shoot everybody right how do you balance that um i remember being in sixth grade and she walked me into the laundry room and put the laundry detergent on and said this is how this machine works congratulations <laughs> you are on your own right i'm not washing your smelly gym clothes every day for the next eight years. What a right? gift so, he gave you there. Right. So the, it was a gift, but as a 14 year old, I feel like it's abuse, right? What's happening to me. And so it's both end, right? There's a lot of sacrifices in our home. There's a lot of hurt feelings and a lot of figuring things out along the way. Um, but I got to watch what, what, it, what comes with chasing something that mean is a meaning. To you. So man, let's talk about chasing something of meaning. You, you go off. I was going to spend a lot of time talking about Miss Mosley back in second grade and rock and roll playing in high school and everything else. We could go down memory lane, John, sometime just one on one. But with all of our listeners tuning in, let's, let's go forward to meaning into college. What, what were you seeking? What, what did you think you wanted to do in your life? So one of the byproducts of having a cop and a minister as a dad is you live in a side of a glass house inside of a glass house. I became extraordinary at deception, at lying, at just, I just walked through life like the rules didn't apply. So I was seeking validation at all, every corner of my life, financial validation. Am I good enough? Am I funny enough? Am I loud enough? Can I play the guitar well enough? Can I rock loud enough? Am I unique enough? Right? It never stopped. It was always, always, always. And so um, entering into college, I thought I would be a minister. And then that, <laughs> that for those who know me in college, that lasted about 11 minutes, I think. <laughs> um, I wanted to work in business and my head wasn't geared towards that. I ultimately, and I wish it was a less romantic story. I went and one weekend I saw Goodwill Hunting. I think I saw it by myself. And I remember leaving that movie and I, the Robin Williams character I identified with deeply. And I remember saying, I want that. I want to do that. And I went and changed my major on Monday. Ended up pursuing, how do I get into, I want to be a psychologist. I want to work for the FBI. I want to do something along those lines. And I ended up a high school teacher through a long series of, can you believe this? And the right park conversation in a parking lot to here to there. Um, I ended up working in higher education um, as the associate dean of students, working with student conduct. Students had done something that had gotten them out of con out of relationship with their community, you know, um, right. drugs, alcohol, things like that, assault and things like that. And so at a really young age, I was absorbing some heavy, heavy consequences of behavior and then having to walk kids through some really dark moments and then their families. And then that just expanded from there. You're a young guy back then. You're uh, not fully baked, not fully mature yet. <clears throat> How do you meet these young people where they are, but also take care of yourself so that you don't go all the way down with them? I did. My wife would tell you I'm not fully baked or mature yet either now, but back then I did a terrible job. It was all about, can I be cool? 
can I walk alongside these students? And I didn't have the, I mean, I didn't have the tools. Um, yeah. And so I didn't have coping strategies. I thought you just work harder and faster and longer and do it louder and do it bigger and do it with more bang and more flash. And all of that jet fuel has a relatively short shelf life. Right. And um, fast forward to a few years later, I'm working at a university. I've got a dream job and my validation that I was chasing at this point, I was the treadmill was as hot as it could go. Right. I'm working full time as an administrator. I took a full time faculty job with the agreement. They paid me a full faculty salary on top. So I'm working two full time jobs. And then the president asks me to be a part of a think tank to look at the future of higher ed. I took that, too. And then I took a did a program at Harvard. And then I was teaching Sunday school and I was working at a college ministry and I was running a convocation program every week. I was just chasing and chasing and chasing and chasing and chasing. And so when I looked financially, my wife and I, she's a researcher professor too at the time, and we were making more money than my granddad could have wrapped his head around. Mm. Uh, we were six figures in the whole student loan stuff. We were trying to figure out about how all this stuff was happening. And my body just said, Hey bro, I'm out. I'm out. And that was a, it was existentially unwinding because I was just doing, I was just playing the playbook that I'd been given, which is get the degrees and get the job and get the titles and get the girl and have the kid and have the house and get the cars and repeat. And my body said, we're out. Right. So then what? So as the, the, the story goes, um, I was getting my job done. I'm, I was good at work. I could get the stuff done. And that's the, that's the thing. I think most of these stories end up in rehab. I never went to rehab. I didn't have a drug problem. I didn't burn anything down. I didn't cheat on my wife. What I did was I turned the burner on real low and I melted everybody around. me. And I think that can be more devastating sometimes because there's a gaslighting aspect to it. They think it must be them. And my son thinks it must be his problem that dad doesn't want to connect because he's too busy. So my son tries to solve that. Or my wife tries to solve that disconnection because it's not blatant and it's not loud. I'm not screaming and knocking stuff over. It's that quiet desperation mm. that, that they talk about. And it slowly drags everybody down. And at the same time, I was a bit bonkers. John, I was crazy. And so I had, <laughs> I don't want to speak directly to your audience, but let's say we all have a friend who's really into the COVID conspiracies, who's really into, oh yeah, well, you know what's really happening? That was me. And I've come to learn that in many cases, it's a pathology. It's a way of our mind is grasping desperately for control in situations where we've lost control. And so I had convinced myself that I had predicted the next housing collapse and the next market collapse. And so we'd sold our house and I'd moved me and my wife and my two-year-old into a residence hall, into a dorm surrounded by college kids. And one day I was walking to work. By this time, I was over so much stuff that my boss wouldn't have known if I was gone for a week or two, if I just answered my cell phone. I didn't even tell my wife and I hopped in her little Corolla. And I drove it three hours away to another city to a buddy who's a medical doctor. And I walked in his office and said, dude, I don't know what's wrong, but I'm not okay. And that was the very first time I'd ever uttered those words out loud in my life ever. Mm. You came out with a book recently and I'm, uh, we're going to step into it in a moment, but I think what you're talking about here is referencing ultimately the cracks that you were seeing around you in your life. And so I'm going to read you a quote from you. So this is a poorly written. You've got no one to blame but yourself. So here we go, man. The cracks are a sign, not a conclusion. The cracks are shadows of something deeper going on in your life. Cracks are signals that the beginning might be coming toward an end. They might be a windshield, the mortar between the bricks on a decaying old house, a shattering window in an abandoned building, or this is the good part, or cracks and signal growth, old skin making way for new skin. I like that analogy. A butterfly leaving the cocoon, a bird breaking free from an egg. Cracks allow light into the darkness. What are you writing about here, John? So at this season of my life, one of my roles in the university was when a student had a psychiatric break, if they had, were really struggling, if they were super intoxicated and somebody had to make the call as to whether they went to the hospital or not, I was that guy. I was the guy who called mom and dad and said, we don't know if your son or daughter is going to make it tonight um, through the night. We need you to get to town ASAP. And so I was the guy other people went to. And at the same time, and I, I did a good job. I was good at that job. Right. And at the same time, I was imploding on the inside. And the irony is one night it's pouring down rain and I thought my house was falling apart. 
this was just a thing that my anxiety and OCD had locked onto, that my house has cracks in it. It's fallen apart. I was crawling around in my flower bed in the middle of the night, um, looking for where the water was seeping into these cracks. And I, it was just a moment of clarity. And I sat up and I started laugh, laugh crying, which I love. And I thought, oh, this is when they call me to come in and deal with this guy. It, it was this, this moment of like, what if it's me? Right. I'm not finding any cracks here. And that question is, is, is been both a gift and haunted me for the last, you know, 15, 20 years. What if it's me? And I think that's the most, it's, it's the path to, towards humility. It's the path towards grace. It's the path towards a good marriage. It's the path towards being a, a good, um, healthy human being looking in the mirror first before I go to war. What am I contributing to this? What if this is about me too? And starting from there. Well, it's, it's a line, line in a perfect on where I want to go next. Cause I think what if it's me is a question every one of us ought to be asking ourselves right now. What, what, if, what if it's me? So let me, let me give you another quote that you wrote in the book. We spend so much energy blaming, screaming, hating, and seeking to burn everything and everyone down that doesn't align with our view. Yet nothing changes. And then you quote my brother, Victor Frankel, when you write, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. Talk about the importance of first owning your story and then changing yourself going forward. Well, we've been given these two narratives, not so much two narratives. We've been given two paths and that's it. Our whole world has been reduced to two paths. One path is you were always going to be the worst thing that ever happened to you. You will always be a survivor of X. You're always going to be that kid who is, you're going to always be an abuse survivor. You're always going to be uh, the thing that happened to you or, or you're always going to be the worst thing you ever did. You build a thousand bridges, you feed a million people, but you cheated. You're always going to be a cheater. And since you're the worst thing that ever happened to you, you are always going to need somebody to come help you out. You're always going to need some entity. The government's going to come pick you up because you can't do it because this is all you'll ever be. Your feelings are all that matters. You get to make truth up as you walk down the road. This is everything. That's path one. Mm. And path two we've been given is if you have feelings at all, you're weak. You're a coward. Suck it up. Quit feeling. Grind it. Crush it. Drag it. Kill it. All of those cool, cool words, right? And get on with yourself. Life is short. It's hard. Get over it crush it, get a bunch of trophies and get a bunch of skins on the wall and then you die. And what I'm calling, I'm calling bull crap on both paths. And the, the book is really a new third way, right? It's a third path, which is you have to own what happened or your body will solve for those things for the rest of your life. You've got to own the fact that your dad never looked you in the eye and said, I love you because your body's going to be looking for that validation everywhere for the rest of your life. You got to own that story. And then you got to own the fact that your uncle abused. You got to own the fact that people treat you differently because of the color of your skin or because your body is different than theirs. And then you got to go to the mirror and say, and what do I do now? What comes next? And we simply don't have a culture or narrative for an honest, helpful, hopeful way of moving past what comes next. Mm. Why do you think that is, John? Why, why do you think it seems somehow almost more powerful for us to blame it on being burned as a kid, being abused as a young person, dealing with the divorce, the bankruptcy, whatever the thing was in our past, than embracing where we are and what we can do next? I mean, I, I'm talking to the one of the most extraordinary men I've ever had the opportunity to speak to and, and, to answer this question. That you're, you're much better equipped. Getting up is hard. It's the worst. It's, it's every single day. It's every single minute. And that's exhausting. We're not designed for that sort of like pulling. Man, how much easier is it? How much more comfortable is it? How much more is gratifying and satisfying is it to say, I hurt, my pain exists because of fill in the right. blank. And the daily grind in the real true, not just psychological pain, the physical pain, the toll, the always that is making new choices and working through thoughts and changing your actions. It is, it, it's your life's work and it's not fun and it's not pleasant. Anybody, it's cool to say my mom got a PhD after 15 years. It was not cool watching her cry at the dinner table doing a research paper at 2 a.m. with three kids. It wasn't, right? That's part of the story that doesn't get told. And so we don't have pictures of what that looks like. 
And when you don't have pictures or models, you just default to the current ethos and the current ethos is blame and point fingers, man. Right. Johnny, in, in the book, you try to guide us through a pathway that it's going to ultimately make us free, you know, like tr- truly free to become the best versions of ourselves as we were, we were designed ultimately to be. The second step along the way is to acknowledge reality, which sounds kind of obvious, but also kind of impossible. You know, it's so easy to get lost in the lies of what we tell ourselves or what others told us about ourselves or about life. So how do we begin to acknowledge reality? Some of us, some of y'all, I'll say some of y'all, I'm not. Um, Some people are gifted and blessed with the ability to look in the mirror and own reality. Here's what I mean by that. I have to take ownership of the abuse of the disordered eating that I saw as a kid. And again, I'm speaking not in my home, but as an every man, um, I have to take ownership of, I mean, I've got to own these stories uh, that I was told that I was born into. And then I have to look in the mirror and say, I'm a hundred pounds overweight. And so what am I going to do now? Some of us can look in the mirror and make that call. Some of us can look in the mirror and say, I treat my wife terribly. And today that has to stop. Most of us have to get other people in our life that we trust, that we care about to help us see those things. And when you look, when you pan back, I think the chief enemy of our time is loneliness. I think we're dying from the inside out because we're so incredibly lonely. And most of us don't have that, that person. What we do have is a culture saying, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. And in many cases it's not, but the solution is going to be, in your heart and mind. And to quote an earlier conversation we're having, it's going to be about where you move your feet, right? What you do with your hands. And so, man, you got to look in the mirror and own reality. What about your world needs to be different? Or what about the, the, here's the fact, my oldest best friend on planet earth, the weekend after he graduated college as a double major, his frat brother ran a stop sign and he is a paraplegic forever. You have to look and here we are 25 years later, right? He has to look in the mirror and say every day, this is my mobility challenge for today, period, at the end of that sentence. And he can then have somebody wheel him back to bed or he can say, so here's what I'm going to do about it today. Mm. Here's what I'm going to do in spite of it today, right? And that's where we all find ourselves in something sensational like that or I'm tired of walking past my kid's bedroom and I've just handed him a digital babysitter. I'm tired of not knowing how to bridge that gap. I've got to mend the relationship with my kid. And since I'm the adult, that starts with me, not them. And they don't like me because of a context I've created for them, not because they're defective. And I have to bridge that gap. And I don't have the tools. And so I'm going to go get the tools. But it starts with me owning reality. Man, that's good. The calls you take day after day and the book you wrote whispers, but I'll roar it out right now, about the crisis around loneliness, around isolation, around feeling like uh, you have a million friends, but none of them know you. So the first question is, why do you why do you think that is? And then how do we begin to get connected with those around us in a more authentic, genuine human way? Anybody who says there's a one stop shop to the loneliness epidemic, they're just selling you snake oil. I think it's architectural. I think, you know, up until, you know, several decades ago, all of our houses had front porches on them because we didn't have air conditioners and that's how we stayed cool. And that's how you saw your neighbors. And then it moved to the back porch and then there's no porches to we used to go to the theater or the. <laughs> Because right. I was born in 1808, we went to the, the movies, the movies, right? <laughs> um, we went and watched movies together. We went and watched concerts together. We went and watched sporting events together. We did life together. That's how that, we, we hunted food together to go back a few decades, right? We worked the farm together. We did these things together that because of extraordinary advancements in technology, now the concert just gets pumped into my living room. And now my coffee just gets delivered to my home. Right. And our body solves for familiar all of the time. And so, and it solves for safety. And so when I'm less and less around others who look like me, who look different than me, who think differently than me, whatever. And I'm just on this steady diet of toxic media telling me that they're the problem. Those people are the enemy. That's, those are the ones who are going to kill you. If they look like that. They're coming for you, man. Then your body just starts to bake that into its wiring system. Right. And it just slowly gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And then I think the last 15, 20 years, we're dealing with something the world's never dealt with, which is, uh, I think the great Anna Lemke out of Stanford calls it the uh, continuous dopamine drip of social media 
that just allows us to transmit information to people all over the planet. But transmitting information is different than connection. It's very, mm. very different. It doesn't include our bodies. It doesn't include our minds. It doesn't include our body posture. Um, one of the, when I talk to parents of, of teens, I often talk about kids graduating high school have seen tens and tens and tens of thousands of dead bodies, but because we don't want them to be sad or hurt, they've never been in the room with an actual dead body. They've never felt the weight of that room with a dead grandparent because mom and dad don't want the kids to be um, uncomfortable so they don't go to the funeral. Mm. They've seen a million acts of sexuality on TV, but they've never burned a whole movie just trying to reach over and hold somebody's hand, right? And that, that slow, gradual heart race and then drop and then, oh no, is she, did she just move away? Is he trying to reach over, right? And so we've just gone zero to 60 and we've got all these experiences in our frontal lobe, but we have zero experiences in our bodies. Mm. And so all of that together, man, we are lonely, lonely, lonely. Well, we're highly connected. Can Here I stop you real quick? Can I ask you a question? Yes. This is always a, a, a delicate balance for me because I walk alongside so many people for so many years. I have walked alongside people for, for so long. But it's always really important for me to be a message bearer, but not the storyteller. I want to make sure I'm always pointing back to truth of people in, through lived experience. And so I want to ask you, I'm doing an interview later today on women's stress. And I told my wife that this morning and she smiled at me and said, oh, really? Tell me more. <laughs> right. Um, Mr. Expert, tell me how I'm feeling. Right. So <laughs> given your experience. What does owning the stories and acknowledging reality, how did that play into your story? Does that ring true to you? Or are you in your back of your head? Are you calling BS on the whole thing? So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the John Deloney podcast. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is now John O'Leary. Who knew the, the, the flip was, uh, the script was about to be flipped. Here we go. So John, listen, man, I, Kierkegaard wrote, life must be lived forward, but it can only be understood backward. And that is a fact. You've got to be able to embrace where you've come from in order to be able to celebrate where you can go next. And, and for me, the, the turning point, and I'll be very brief because I really, I'm, I'm here today to celebrate your wisdom, not what I've learned. But when I was a little boy home struggling, a victim to my past, truly a victim to my past, uh, I told my dad all about it. And then I told him all about it again. And then I told him all about it a third time and then a fourth time. And then finally, my dad got up and shut the bedroom door, came back in and said, John, dang it. And he was even more adamant than the word, dang it, John, dang it. You can be a victim to all that you've been through for the rest of your life. And nobody will blame you. Every room that you will roll into people will respect you for what you've endured, or you can choose to rise up. You can choose to be a victor and any room that we roll you into, or one day you will walk into people will look up and they will admire not only what you've been through, but what you're doing with your life now. And then my dad kissed me on the forehead. And then he said, John, victim or victor, your choice. What he was referring to, though, was not the life forward. It was embracing the life already lived. And so when, you, when you're when you unpacking this, if you own your past, you change your future. I'm nodding my head because that's a fact. Mm. And we do neither of those things very well individually or collectively. We don't own our past. We complain about our past. We're great at that. It trends on social media. We don't really desire to change our future. We, we kind of whisper about it, but we don't really desire to do the hard work the painful work to change where we want to go next individually or collectively. So yes, man, when you are writing these things or you're taking the calls, I'm with you fully because I think the path you've laid out is the one we've got to walk. Beautiful. Thanks brother. Victim or Victor. I'm going to keep that one in the old soul pocket. Well, quote it appropriately, not John O'Leary, Denny, De Denny. Dr. Denny O'Leary. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, we'll go back, yeah, back to your show. I'm going to have you back on because I want to unpack just the shows that you've done, taking questions that others have asked you. Well, I'm asking you almost layup questions, questions around your path, your life, your book. These are questions you know, should know the answers to. Ask me some hard ones, man. Let's do it. You take a call. You're sitting there in your buttoned up shirt, man, and you're rolling live on YouTube and across a national signal. And someone calls in and says, I just found out that my girlfriend gave me HIV. What should I do? You, you woke up and you took your two kids to school. You kissed your wife goodbye. <laughs> you sat down at the desk. And this is a call you took. This yeah. is not me exaggerating. Uh, hey, my girlfriend. And you can handle this from the, the, the Christian angle. What do you mean, my girl? How's that even? So you get this, this question coming in from a guy who is broken from Des Moines, Iowa. I remember it well. 
how do you first prepare yourself for the unknown of the questions that are going to be showing up in your life, John? And then how do you compassionately, but also boldly meet them where they are and uh, allow them to change their future going forward? So there That's it is. Great question. The, the most important hack to, to the show, to those type of questions is I've been taking those questions for 20 years. When a student would walk into my office and say, hey, man, I've got HIV and I got it from my girlfriend. I don't know what to do. Like I, I've had that question. Hey, my son or daughter just came home and they told me that they're having a baby. I don't know what's next. So the, those type of things, I've been taking that question for so long. And I think most of us, when somebody else comes into our presence with pain, with hurt, we immediately go limbic in our bodies, right? It's a, it, it's a trauma that we experience, we co-experience with somebody and we are desperate for what I think has become a toxicity, a poison in our culture. And it's the quote unquote right answer. Hmm. We become obsessed with the right answer instead of being with people while they're hurting. And if you will be with people while they're hurting, almost always the answer emerges. And I know that sounds all woo woo and spiritual, but really I've got a set of principles for how I interact with people. One of them is I don't answer questions they're not asking. I go to church. That's how I've chosen to do life. That's how my family chooses to do life. A lot of people who call my show haven't made that choice. And so when they're asking me about problem X, I'm not going to answer them with problem Y. I'm going to answer them with problem X. And to me, that's a sign of hospitality. And if I look at the way I, you know, I'm a Christian guy. So if I see how Jesus answered questions, he answered, often answered the question that was being asked. He didn't throw a bunch of others. Oh, well, what about this too? I only got three seconds with you for eternity. That's just not how he addressed people. He addressed hurting people. And the, the second thing is, I always want to circle back to, yes, there's a lot of smoke going on. How can I distill this down into giving you your power back? And most of us make those calls and we are completely powerless. That's how we feel. Somebody has stolen our autonomy. Someone has stolen our power. Someone's hurt us in a way that we, our bodies have cashed out. And what I'm trying to do in a call like that is look at this young man and say, your options have been severely restricted. Here's a couple of things you can do next. Mm. And I'm trying to give them a path forward. And so, man, you can look at the sensationalism of it all, but really it's, it's a very simple, I'm going to be hospitable. I'm going to offer you a beer when you sit down with me. And then we're going to say, okay, <laughs> what can you do right. next? One thing I noticed, John, about you, and I, I applaud it, man, because um, it, it's not common in the marketplace, certainly not common among most interviewers, is you almost always follow up their question with a question yourself, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one, and then about seven minutes into your answer, you haven't yet begun given an answer. Once you get to know really the circumstances and the human being in front of you, that's when you begin laying a little, a little loving truth in front of them. And it is a, an unusual approach. And I think it is the only one ultimately that allows people to change their future. Oh, I'm grateful for that, man. Yeah. The last so, thing people need is another <clears throat> six foot two dude who works out too much. Cause I low <laughs> self-esteem to be throwing uh, <laughs> here's what you got to do. Like, man, get to know somebody for a second first. Right. We're, we're about to move into what we call the live inspired seven around here. Your buddy, Dave among and Rachel and a whole lot of other leaders there have gone through these seven. They are safe questions to answer. So get ready. for it. <laughs> Let's do it. Before we do, we keep hearing from people that we want to get back to the a new normal. You know, like it just, we're kind of done with this and we want to get back to the new normal. And, and you remind us very clearly that ain't happening. So tell us why the new normal is not happening and what can we do to uh, make a better future, a better normal going forward? So our bodies are designed for familiarity. It will always try to pull us back to familiar. It's why you can grind and white knuckle your way to 50 pounds of weight loss. Your body will solve for the equilibrium. It wants to go back to where it knew, even though that normal will kill you, right? Even though that abusive relationship, you almost didn't make it as a kid, you're going to find somebody that your body reminds you of, the, of a familiar relationship. And that's how the abuse cycles continue, right? That's what they say. Uh, if you get a million dollars, you have a thousand dollars. You're going to be the same person with your money because your body solves for familiar. Okay, so we're going to take that and put a pin in it. When something happens, the first thing we do is we, we say, when things get back to normal. Like when my wife got pregnant, the first thing I thought was, 
all right, cool. Once this kid's born and quote unquote, <laughs> things get back to normal, we can just have sex whenever we want to. We can go on dates whenever we'll have all of our money back. I just need to get through this nine month window. And then about four months after my son was born, I was like, that's yeah, going to be a little bit longer than I thought to get back to normal, but it's going to be like two years, two years. And then things get back to right. We get this new promotion. We get our, we lose our job are always trying to quote unquote, go back to normal. Mm. And I absolutely love, I think it's Esther Perel's the one, I think she's the therapist who gave, gave me this analogy and I just use it all the time. And she was talking to a couple who'd experienced infidelity. Somebody cheated on somebody. And the, the one spouse chose to stay, they reconciled. And both of them kept saying, we just want things to get back to normal the way they were. And the analogy she gave that was so beautiful was, you could not go sweep up all the dust and glass and you couldn't pick up all the twisted steel of the twin towers and recapture all of the gas mm. and all the concrete and rebuild the twin towers. They have fallen down. It is over. Period at the end of that sentence. You have to own that story. They're down. The only thing left for you to do, the new adventure in your life, is to excavate the whole thing. And for most of us, we got to get professionals to come help with that type of excavation. You're going to get teams of construction workers and architects and engineers and designers and artists. And we're going to build something even stronger. And some would say arguably more beautiful as a monument to what was, and more importantly, a pathway into the future. There is no life going back to life before the pandemic. We've lost core trust. In right. our churches, in our schools, in our government, in our health system, there is no going back. And what we need is some extraordinary leadership in rebranding, rebuilding, reconstructing these things moving forward, because these are the pillars that hold societies together. There is no going back to two years of work from home. We lost a lot of things. We lost a lot of weddings. There was a lot of funerals that were done in silence. A lot of people died lonely in a, in a hospital bed because they wouldn't let them be visited. My daughter lost her first week of kindergarten, which has continued to ripple through her entire first year of kindergarten because she missed those first week or two when it's all getting to know you. Game. She's still on the outside. And so there is no going back. And the more we try to go back and go back and try to reclaim that, the more we are not owning reality. We're not acknowledging. It. And so we have to say, okay, this happened. Russia's invaded. There's a period. I lost my job. There's a period in that sentence. What comes next? And right. that's where our energy needs to be. We've got to let go of what happened and build something new. And it's scary, man, because it's unknown. There's an unknown out there. Um, what if it happens again? What if that building falls down? It might, but that's the only choice you've got. Mm. The book is called Own Your Past, Change Your Future. The author is my friend, Dr. John Deloney. I read it. I loved it. And in a world where we keep looking backward, my friends, or forward, John reminds us how to pull both together, how to really celebrate where we've been, acknowledge that, learn the lessons, and apply them going forward. It's a brilliant book, and there's a clear pathway for you and I and our society to walk together. So, John, the final seven questions to Live Inspired 7, it is a sprint forward, so grab your track shoes. I know oh, you're an extra guy. Here it. we let's go, my friends. What is the most impactful book you've ever read? I don't want to talk about it by Terrence Real. I don't want to talk about what is what is it about? Um, the subtitle, I think, is the worst subtitle in subtitle history um, because it kept everyone from reading it. It's the secret legacy of male depression. It told this story of that most people have a picture of depression of curling up in a ball and going. <sighs> and what he unwound both through the science and through his experience as a therapist, um, that men display depression by putting their chest out by getting mm. loud, by going first, by swinging first. And it reframed the pain I see in our culture. It reframed the pain I see in the mirror. It helped me be a better dad and helped me love mm. my dad more. Um, and so it's an extraordinary read. Um, I've given it to everybody. Dave, I give it to everybody. Um, it's a powerful, powerful read. I don't want to talk about it by Terrence Real. You and I are recording this uh, the week after there was a slapping incident on an international stage by two world renowned uh, actors. And when I saw that, what I saw was a very broken guy, shoulders back, chest barreled forward, slapping down, which I thought was just evidence of brokenness. You know, and so I, I think this book, I, I haven't heard about it. I'm going to read it because I think we as men, we as leaders need to learn a lot more about what depression looks like and how to 
how to talk candidly about it. So uh, thank I think you. Our wives that. need to read it. Yeah. And hey, read it and, and let me know what you think of it. I will. What's one positive characteristic or one cool trait that you possess as a little boy growing up outside of Houston that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? I was so carefree. Um, I was quick, quick, quick to laugh. I was quick, quick, quick to be all in. And 20 years of working in trauma, 20 years of being an administrator, basically a politician at universities, um, that edge has worn off me. Mm. And so my wife says that she can tell what generation of friend I'm talking to by the language I use on the phone. I swore a lot when I was a third grader, man. We were loud and rambunctious and silly and goofy and getting into trouble and jumping off things. I want to get that guy back. That's one of my, I don't want to pass along a boring politician to my son. I want him to hang on to his recklessness as long That's as awesome. Can. Remain reckless. If your home caught fire, John, bride and babies are out safely and you have an opportunity to run in and grab one item, what would you save? Oh my goodness, man. Off the top of my head, I'd grab the, this is such a stupid dad answer. I'd grab the fireproof box because it's got all the paperwork in it. Dude, it's not going to uh, burn. It's safe, dude. It's not going to burn. So what else would you grab? I'm going to preface my answer with this and I'm going to do it really quick because I know we're sprinting. I think the longer I've sat with people who are, ha, whose child is dead in the next room over, the longer I've sat with people who've lost everything, the less hold possessions have on the mm. less stock I put in things. Um, I gave away, I've kept a bunch of my granddad's clothes who passed away a few years ago and I got rid of them the other day and that was hard for me. And I remember thinking to myself, my granddad is not in these clothes. So off the top of my head, I have one guitar that I've had autographed by a number of people that I just truly love. And I'd probably grab that. It's beautiful. All of that is beautiful. Thank you. If you could sit on a bench on a gorgeous day and have a long conversation with anyone living or passed away, who would you want to be seated next to? Robin Williams. Uh, what's the best advice Robin Williams, your granddaddy, your parents, uh, Miss Moberly, or anybody else ever gave you? So the best advice Dr. John Deloney ever received is? I would go back to my high school track coach, Zoe Simpson, who looked at me in the eyes one day when I was questioning whether I could do something that he was asking me to do. And he leaned very close to me and um, he said, John, you can do anything. Mm. And then he put in he didn't just use words. He then put me in a position that showed me he believed that that to be true. And so I think a lot of words that have been given to me have been great, but I think people's actions have been more like they put me in positions and said with their actions, right. this is how much I trust you. So the words were you can do anything, but it was the action that changed a life. What would you tell your 20 year old self? Chill out chill out stop worrying about everything you think you're old now god help you man chill out you think you want this title and you think you want this much money listen people with that title earn it and they don't sleep and they don't hang out with their friends and their relationships with their wives has a gap between them all of these things that you think you want come at an extreme cost you're 20 relax Get the wisdom underneath you. Put the reps in. John Deloney, it has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like yours to read? There's never a time to not be kind. There's never a situation where you can't find humor. And often, most of the time, almost always, say less than you think you should. Mm. John Deloney found times to be kind to be humorous as an international broadcaster to say less than maybe he felt like he should. And in doing so, reminded people of the power of owning their past, changing their future and recognizing that God is still God and the best is yet to come. My friends, you have been listening to my friend, Dr. John Deloney. John, where can we learn more about the book? Go to johndeloney.com or ramseysolutions.com. Yeah. Well, it's, it's worthy. It's worth checking out. And I want to thank you for your time today, John. It's one of the great honors of my professional career. So thank you so much. And I look forward to hanging out in person soon. Me too. My friends, that is Dr. John Deloney. He's the author of Own Your Past, Change Your Future. My name is John O'Leary. Today is your day. Live inspired. One of my favorite parts about John Deloney 
is that when these calls arrive in his world, he doesn't snap into judgment. He doesn't quickly pivot into fixing the problem. One of the best characteristics of this man is he always takes the call, whatever that call is, listens to the issue, whatever the issue might be, and sometimes they are way above my pay grade, and always responds compassionately, faithfully, empathetically with more questions. I just love his open heart to meet others empathetically at the well where they are. I got to let you know, though, that I'm going to build John for a new notebook because I jotted down so many takeaways from our conversation. While I certainly love the time together, the discussion on loneliness and the epidemic that has raged since the global pandemic is the one that I think is going to stick with me the most. One of the things John said, I wrote this down word for word, is this. We spend so much energy blaming, screaming, hating, and seeking to burn everything and everyone down that does not align with our view. Yet nothing changes when we do this. It's powerful. We spend so much time and energy blaming and screaming and hating and seeking to burn down everything and everyone who doesn't align with our worldview. And yet when we do this, nothing changes. So my friends, one of the ways we can begin changing the world, improving our relationships, elevating our lives, is to do what John does every day of his life. It's to practice the gift of question asking. It's to meet others compassionately where they are. It's to faithfully lean into God to recognize that in spite of the change and challenge all around us and sometimes within us, that the foundation is firm and far better days remain ahead. At the very beginning of our episode, I shared that Dr. John Deloney's book is catching the eyes and the thought leaders, including New York Times bestselling authors, Patrick Lencioni, Dr. Les Parrott, and Dave Ramsey. Did you know that Patrick Lencioni is not only a phenomenal leadership speaker and teacher and author, but also a friend? He's been on our podcast. You can listen more to Patrick Lencioni at episode 214. Did you know that Les Parrott? has also be, been a friend and been on our podcast. You can learn more about Les at episode 34. You're going to love it, relationship gurus. And finally, Dave Ramsey. If you want to learn more about Dave Ramsey, his financial steps to freedom, and the painful and ultimately redemptive story that led to it, Dave was one of my very first guests on the Live Inspired podcast. You can learn more about money and life and business and Ramsey by tuning in to episode number six. As always, I'm going to have links to these at the Live Inspired podcast. You can check it out at johnolearyinspires.com forward slash podcast. Or I'm sure you're all tuning in and subscribe to the podcast by now. Let your fingers do the walk in episodes 214, episode 34, and episode 6 are all worthy of tuning in to today. So speaking of today, for this time, and until next time, I want to thank you for being part of our Live Inspired family, and I want to remind you that the best of your days are ahead. Stay bold, stay humble, and live inspired. Well, Akili Company's culture sets them apart, and their people live out the unique culture every single day. Perhaps it's best seen through their philanthropic foundation called Keely Cares. It was built on a passion for giving of their time, their talent, and their treasure to help improve the communities in which they live and where they work. We're so excited that they were named one of the top corporate philanthropists by the St. Louis Business Journal for 2021. You can learn more about Keeley Cares by visiting them online at keeleycompanies.com.